Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, an, an, an option uh, available to community owners uh, involving a lease with an option to purchase as a means of selling homes in communities. I want to thank George for having me and all of you for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a lot of data. Uh, I'll cover uh, over 100 slides in the next 45 minutes. Um, some of this may be hard to read from all the way in the back of the room, so feel free to move up and, uh, and, and uh, you may be able to see better. Uh, please hold your questions until I finish. I, I'll stay as long since uh, we have nothing after this uh, to talk with you about any questions that you have uh, afterwards. All slides are numbered. If you see something that you want to talk about later, make a note of the slide number and, uh, and we can talk about it then. You're welcome to take photographs of any of the slides, and I will post this entire presentation, including the uh, video, on our uh, website. So here are uh, some of the topics that I'll try to cover. A little bit of background on myself. Um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about seller financing, where we've been, where we are, where we're going. Uh, why seller financing is important to us as community owners. A little bit about the legal basis of lease option, the structure of lease option transactions, a topic which is near and dear to my heart, which is defaults of the seller financing that we're doing. It obviously doesn't do any good to finance things if most uh, people that you're financing uh, default. Uh, I want to tell you about something that we started about six years ago in law, uh, uh, what we refer to as our pre-qualification worksheet. And as I'll show you later, this worksheet has substantially reduced our defaults. I'll talk a little bit about some myths, some things that I've heard uh, over the past few years as I have done these presentations, myths about uh, lease options, and then uh, some questions that we hear frequently. So uh, without uh, further delay, I'm a small operator. I have four communities. Uh, three in Georgia, one in Texas, total of about 450 sites. Um, what I'll be showing you today is the best information I have. Uh, I'll do everything I can to help you. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what our experience has been. Uh, but realize that uh, I'm, I'm not 21st mortgage. I don't have thousands and thousands of these loans to be able to draw on. Uh, fortunately, I do have about 25 years of experience. Um, but um, in the long run, what I'm talking about here today is our data and relatively small samples. Uh, one of our communities, as I say, is in Texas, and the good news about Texas is it's dependent on the oil and gas industry, and the bad news is it's dependent on the gas and oil industry. So Texas is somewhat of a unique situation for us, uh, maybe not exactly representative of all of us. And then finally, uh, I recognize that what I'm saying here today uh, is my experience and may not be representative of yours. Uh, what I'm not, I'm not an attorney, I'm not an accountant, uh, not an expert, and I'm not a consultant. I don't go around the country doing this for money. Uh, in fact, I won't do it for money. I don't, I don't accept money from anybody. So this is my way of helping community owners as I have been helped over the past 30 years or so that I've been in this business. So you would ask, why aren't those guys up here? Well, one answer is my billing rate's probably a lot lower than theirs. Can't get much lower than zero. Uh, but I hope that whatever I uh, cannot uh, make up, that those guys would in terms of their credibility and, and their help, I hope I can make up for the fact that I am a community owner. I have been for 30 something years. And I've had about 25 years, as I say, experience in this business of buying and selling houses. This was the first house that we bought in 1991. Uh, tried to sell it, uh, thought we could sell it. Um, there's the uh, manufacturer's invoice on it. It was a peach state, $15,000. Total cost on the house was about $22,000. We were trying to sell it for twenty-four, dollars And we couldn't because, as you may guess, most of the people who wanted to buy the house from us were not approved or acceptable to the finance companies. So after beating our brains out for the better part of a year, we realized that although we had the house and we could sell the house, uh, we couldn't get the financing on it. So 
So the first house that we actually did a lease purchase, lease option, sorry, contract on was about a year later. It happened to also be a peak state. It was a different one than the one we first bought. But uh, this particular uh, transaction went very, very well. I don't know if you can read that, but uh, we signed it, <clears throat> excuse me, in June of 92. Uh, it turned out to be one of our very best uh, contracts that we ever did. Um, we found out later that we were very, very lucky, uh, probably beginner's luck. Um, but that particular uh, person who committed to the contract fulfilled their commitment to us and eventually got the title to the house. So the very first one of these that we ever did was incredibly uh, successful. It was so successful, uh, we realized later that it was not representative. It was unreasonable on our part to do this contract for 19 and a half years. Uh, as you may have noticed from the slide before, this uh, contract involved $2,400 up front. Up front. $362 a month was the payment on the house, not counting the lot rent. It was a 19 and a half year term, and at the end of that term, they could buy the house for approximately $4,400, and we would apply the $2,400 that they paid up front uh, to that uh, purchase price. So they would obviously owe us $2,000 more, and the way that contract was written is they could pay $333 a month for the next six months. And as I say, we realized later that that was not uh, a good idea to stretch something like this out over 19 and a half years. So we actually amended the contract. We called the buyer in one day and said, we're going to strike the last five years off of your lease option uh, contract. And we reduced it to 15 years. Um, a few other pieces of information over this period of time. We've been involved in buying and selling in our communities a little over 300 houses. Over the past six years, we focused entirely on new houses, and over that period, we have bought and sold 62 new homes. The rest of the houses are what we refer to as repo or used houses. If you hear me talking about selling a repo house, it's selling a house that we probably bought from a finance company after they repossessed it. So it was a used house as opposed to a new house. Those 300 houses over that period of time amounted to about 800 different sales transactions. 90% of those were lease options. A statistic that we're particularly proud of is the fact that 136 of those people who entered into those lease option contracts with us actually fulfilled their commitment and got the title. So here are some photos of some of those folks at our communities who got the titles. When they do, we invite them into the office, we sign the title over to them, and they're happy campers. What was the percentage of the, the total that fulfilled? What was the percentage? 136 out of 300 houses um, would be a figure that you might want to hang your hat on. Uh, most of our houses, uh, especially over the last six years, are new. Um, we are strong believers in the community series uh, home concept, which the guys talked about this morning. Uh, we love the options and features. We put decks on the front and back of our houses. Uh, we underscored all of them, install air conditioning, and do some landscaping. So we buy the house from the plant, not knowing who we're going to sell it to. It's a spec house as far as we're concerned. We bring the house in, we do all of the setup and decks and so forth on it. And, and we're offering it for sale, of course, from the time it comes into the community. It usually takes us about a month or so to get it ready to uh, sell. But people are buying a house that we have bought ourselves, that we spec ourselves, and, and they're, they're buying basically what they see. Spencer, what's the typical mark out for you? Uh, about $2,000. I'll show you a structure later of the uh, actual transaction. But here are some of the houses. Uh, some of them obviously have porches in front. Um, most of them do not. Kurt, in answer to your question, our motivation behind selling these houses is to fill the vacant lots. So we, we do not attempt to make a profit off the sale of the house. We're very happy to fill the vacant lot and get the additional revenue and increase in value associated with that.
Um, also, in terms of our experience, we have used the same lease option contract since day one. That one that I showed you a minute ago that we did in 1992 is essentially the same contract that we're using today. The only change was when the SAFE Act came out, our attorney made a couple of minor tweaks to the uh, contract. But for all intent and purposes, the data that we have in our database is all uh, done under the same underwriting criteria, the same contract, the same procedures. When the SAFE Act came out, I happened to be on the board of directors of a GMH Georgia Manufactured Housing Association, and I got the mortgage loan originator and the mortgage broker license. I realized later I didn't need to have it for what we were doing, so I currently notified the state that I would not be using those licenses for the lease option contracts that we do. But I do hold those licenses, and I've maintained them since then. So a little bit about uh, seller financing. In the old days, there was really no need. Yes, Dennis? Spencer, uh, the, uh, the idea that it is a down payment versus a deposit or security deposit or something like that, does that not fly in the face of the idea of it not being an installment sale, the fact that you call it a down payment? Let me come back to that later. I hope I'll answer your question with some other slides later. Okay. Um, so there was no real need for seller financing in the old days. We had a vacant lot, a local installer usually rented the lot, and the next thing we know is Mr. and Mrs. Smith showed up and was looking for a place to put the house that they were buying from the retailer, and uh, the retailer got them approved with financing, uh, so there was no need for us to, uh, to be involved in financing. Then the land home deals became popular back in the late 80s now, and we saw our vacancy rates go up, so community owners began buying repos from the finance companies and sell financing them. And back then, sell financing amounted to a promissory note, an M schedule, interest rate, and so forth. And then along came the SAFE Act. Uh, we rocked along doing our own seller financing uh, until the SAFE Act in uh, 08. And the SAFE Act basically said that you cannot originate a mortgage without the proper licenses, mortgage loan originator and mortgage broker. But in my opinion, even more important than having the license is all of the compliance and the disclosures associated with a mortgage. If you think about the last time you bought a house, a site built house or whatever, and, and you sat down at the attorney's office and, and, and signed 50 different documents, that's what I would have to do if I complied with the SAFE Act, if I originated uh, mortgages. So, uh, why seller finance? I, I realize I'm preaching to the crowd, uh, to the, to the uh, choir when I, when I uh, ask that question because we usually, most of us, have vacant lots and most of us know the value of filling those vacant lots. So the motivation for us behind seller financing nowadays is to fill those vacant lots. And of course the reason that we do that is to increase the cash flow, and increase the value of our community. And we can go through a very simple model if we look at a hypothetical community with say 100 lots and 25 of them are vacant. If we look at that community over a 10 year period where scenario one is we don't fill any of the vacant lots. Scenario two is we do fill those vacant lots in the, in the first few years or so. And we look at the difference in value of that community 10 years out, scenario one versus scenario two. Um, you'd see that the uh, community would increase in value by about $1.2 million if we don't fill the lots. If we do fill the lots, assuming a 20% marginal operating expense ratio, and that we fill these lots in the first two, three, or four years, that community would actually increase in value $2.6 million. The 2.6 versus the, what we had before, uh, amounts to a $1.4 million increase associated with nothing more than filling those 25 lots. And that works out to about $55,000 per lot. So again, I know I'm preaching to the choir when I say that there's a real benefit in, in filling those, uh, those empty lots, those vacant lots. In addition to the cash flow and the value, they also reduce uh, common area expenses. We don't have people piling trash on vacant lots. Um, new houses also upgrade our communities and attract a better uh, clientele. So in my opinion, there are a lot of advantages to filling those vacant lots, and particularly, as I'll say later, filling them with new houses. 
Another aspect of this is manufacturers want our business. Um, they are clamoring for our business. Uh, Mr. Stroud is in the room here. I'm sure he'll testify to that. Uh, but they've come out with these community series uh, houses. They have great features and options and eye candy and sex appeal and, and so forth. Uh, they're also, as uh, the guys indicated this morning, changing some of their procedures involving service and warranties and, and uh, delivery and, and such things as that. So as a result of the decline in the retailers and the popularity and, and, and sales that are taking place in communities, we're seeing more and more uh, new houses going into communities now than ever before. The guys this morning mentioned an 18% per year uh, increase in homes going into communities. 18% per year for the next 10 years means that six times more houses will go into communities than in today. Uh, Champion actually mentioned a 25% per year increase. That amounts to a 12-fold increase over a 10-year period. And maybe those numbers are unrealistic because as somebody said, we started from a relatively low base. So maybe it's only 10% per year. But 10% per year for the next 10 years is a three-fold increase and the number of houses going into communities. So I, I really think that, that what we're seeing today is going to continue over the next five or 10 years, and, and uh, we'll be talking about this trend many times in the future. So let's talk a little bit about the legal uh, basis for a lease option. As I mentioned early on, I'm not an attorney. Uh, my my, my uh, objective is to attempt to relay to you the information that those folks have given me. Uh, I hope that I can point you in the right direction so that instead of uh, starting from square one, you might start with square five and save some money in terms of uh, developing your own lease option program. Uh, and and uh, as the graphic here indicates, I, I hope that I can uh, help uh, pull some of the pieces of this puzzle together and, and do so in a way that uh, doesn't uh, uh, become a problem. So, uh, in terms of the uh, legal basis for the uh, lease option, um, the big thing that we uh, always talk about is the SAFE Act. Uh, secure and finance, uh, fair enforcement of mortgage licensing. That act that took place in 2008. And basically what it says, as I said a while ago, is that community owners cannot originate or service a mortgage. I think we've, you know, drummed that into community owners for the past six, seven, seven years now, and all of us, I think, know that what we did in the past in terms of a uh, installment contract, an interest rate, an amortization schedule, we can't do anymore unless we hold those licenses. But it's uh, difficult to get our arms around just this because every regulation, if you will, uh, raises another question. So when we talk about originating or servicing a mortgage, obviously a question becomes, what is a mortgage? Um, so we can't do this without the uh, SAFE Act licenses. Um, what the SAFE Act uh, doesn't prevent us from doing, though, is it doesn't prevent us from taking an application. Because like any other landlord, we have property to rent. We have lots to rent. So we can take an application. We can pull someone's credit. We can verify their income, confirm employment, check rental history, and calculate debt to income ratios. What the SAFE Act specifically focuses on is the origination and servicing of mortgages. So, going back to a mortgage, it is a credit transaction on a dwelling where the lender holds a security interest in the asset. So you need those three components. A credit transaction on a dwelling. Remember, it used to be personal property and real property. The SAFE Act closed that loophole by saying we don't care whether it's personal or real. If it's a dwelling, then it, it's, it, 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 it may satisfy the definition of a, of a mortgage. So a credit transaction on a dwelling where you as a lender hold a uh, security interest. If you're holding title to a, to a manufactured home, and you're providing financing, then, then you've probably originated a mortgage. 
Everything I say, though, about mortgages has to recognize that the SAFE Act is federal legislation that is actually interpreted at the state level because banking is a state function. So what applies in one situation doesn't necessarily apply to another. Georgia and Texas, for instance, we think are very receptive to lease option, but other states uh, are not. Some other states are not. So um, when we say that a mortgage is a credit transaction, what is a credit transaction? It's generally what we did in the past. It's a promissory note, it's the interest rate, amortization schedule. <coughs> I'm not sure why that slide is repeating. I don't think it adds anything to what we're doing. Um, so, a couple other comments about lease option. Everything that I'm saying applies to the house itself. Lot rent is separate from the transaction that I'm describing. Um, the lease option involves an, an option to buy the house at a price in the future. So it involves a monthly lease payment. It involves an option payment up front, which we might refer to as a down payment. It involves a term, and it involves what we refer to as the option price. That's what someone can buy the house for in the future. So again, the terminology is a little bit confusing. The option payment is what was paid up front. The lease payment is the monthly payment that they're making throughout the term. Obviously, you've got some term, might be five years or 10 years, and then the option price is what they can buy the house for at that point in time in the future. So, uh, lease option is not rent to own. Some courts have ruled that rent to own or lease purchase is in fact a credit transaction. So those are terms that we shouldn't use. We're not doing rent to own, we're not selling refrigerators or TVs, we're doing a lease with an option to buy. Um, the upfront payment is generally in the neighborhood of five to 10% of the, what would be the sales price of the asset. Uh, it involves a true lease. There's no portion of the payment that accumulates equity. It is a rental amount or a lease amount that is about equal to what that asset would lease for if it were strictly rented. The option price, as somebody mentioned this morning, needs to be the approximate fair market value of that asset at that point in time in the future. So unlike a rent to own where somebody's buying with the last payment or they're buying for a dollar, with a lease option, the, the, the final payment, the payment that they buy the house for, has to be approximately equal to what the parties agree is the fair market value or what will be the fair market value at that point in time in the future. Now, here's a nuance to it, and, and bear with me on this, follow me on this. Mr. Smith signs a contract with you, and he pays X amount of money up front, and he agrees to make a monthly payment for so many years. And at the end of that period of time, he commits to pay X amount. Let's say it's $6,000, and he paid $2,000 up front. So he owes $4,000 more to buy the asset, right? He agreed to buy it for six, he paid two up front, we're gonna give him credit for that, he owes $4,000 more. Nine times out of 10, Mr. Smith will come to you and said, I don't have $4,000. Would you finance that $4,000 for me over the next six months or 12 months? If you agree to finance that $4,000 for him, Holding on to the title, what will you have done? Mortgage loan. You've originated a mortgage. Even if it was zero interest, the fact that you finance that form over some period of time at some interest rate, maybe zero, and you held the title, means you did a credit transaction and you had a security interest in the asset. So if you do that, even though everything else in the transaction was okay, that part of it might not, or probably would not be okay, unless you held the safe license. So what we do 
is at that point in time, and remember, this is eight or 10 years down the pike. This is after they have made uh, their monthly payments and fulfilled every other aspect of their uh, contract. What we do at that point in time is we have them sign an unsecured promissory note and we sign the title over to them. So what we are doing at that point is entering into a credit transaction. We're financing that $4,000. We do it at zero interest because I don't want to uh, fight with anybody about what is a good interest rate. I don't care. Uh, so for us, it's a zero interest rate. Um, but the important thing is that we surrender the title so that we are not holding the title when we are doing this financing, this credit transaction. And, and our attorney feels that if we are not holding the title, then we will not have originated a mortgage and therefore are not subject to the SAFE Act requirements. What happens if they don't pay the 4000 they owe you? What do you do? When our attorney explained this to the state, he said, the likelihood of that happening is about nil and none. I mean, here's somebody who paid 2000 up front, committed to pay 10, 11, or 12 years, four or $500 if it was a new house, does that, fulfills that commitment and now you know the light at the end of the rainbow and and uh, the likelihood of them defaulting at that point is nil and next to none if they pass away though i'm sorry if they pass away what happens that's possible that's possible um and we still have the, the unsecured promissory note so it's not like we have enough but between you and me if somebody died and I had collected 12 years of payments on them at 500 a month plus an upfront payment, I'd just write it off. I'd say the likelihood of that happening was so low that I don't care. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so, so well, I actually two questions. You know, how, how do you justify not, being, not making a, lo a mortgage loan even though, oh, do you, ha you have to have an item mortgage to make a mortgage loan? In other words, it has to be a asset Oh, security. Uh, sure. okay. The other thing is, now that you can do these, we can all do these uh, uh, cash purchases, okay? Where the 21st Mortgage yeah, Cash Program? Where, and, and there's a few others that are, you know, they, they say, well, oh, please lease it, like a legacy and all that, but, they, you know, people are selling homes. But, but if they'll finance it to the buyer, and all we have, well, we have to guarantee it, but, so we guarantee it, you know? Um, why wouldn't you forget about all this and just do that? And and also, you wouldn't have the cost of buying the home and bringing it in and, and setting it up. It's all it's all in the price. Right, I, and I agree that that may not be a bad uh, way for you to go. I was really uh, glad to hear uh, the guys this morning talk about changes that they made to the uh, cash program. Uh, I haven't seen those changes, but they said that the lot rent that the community only used to pay in the past, which used to be eighty percent of the lot rent for the first up to five years is no longer uh, required and also um, one of the other objections I had to it was that uh, they were buying the house on volume so that if I became responsible for that loan uh, I was also uh, responsible for the profit that they had gotten by buying the house based on volume instead of net and I understand they're now buying uh, net so uh, my experience with the cash program is that if I became responsible for that mortgage, it was going to cost me a lot more than if I had done it myself under a uh, lease option. But uh, it, it could be that they've uh, fixed those problems and, and uh, uh, made me a much more attractive program. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, you said you take an unsecured. What did you say you take? Unsecured promissory note. Okay. And if they don't pay, is it, it all tied to their lease or other obligation? Like, if they don't pay you, what's your... It wouldn't be any different that if you and I signed a promissory note, you agreed to give me $100 six months from now, and six months from now we didn't do it. Uh, you know, what option would I have? I could sue you over it, uh, but... but uh, I'll tell you, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of address this later when I talk about myths. But it just never happened. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of transactions that we've done, 136 people right now have uh, gotten titles, and not one 
ever came in and said, hey, I'm thinking about not making payments or I'm not going to pay you. Just, I, as, I, as I'll tell you later, uh, one of the myths in this industry is that people are concerned about the sales price of the house. I'm here to tell you that these people are renting right now and they see this as a way to become a homeowner. They're making the transition from a renter to a homeowner. And all they care about is how much money do I pay up front, how much do I pay a month, and how many months do I have to pay. And what happens between the 12th and the 13th year really doesn't make any difference to them. Yes, sir. We did uh, something very similar to this before the same back and charged interest lease option uh, and we charged interest and we had cases four or five years into the program where the people just literally walked away from the home uh, with you holding a promissory note only uh, what's your recourse if they say I it's after they pay the promissory note is after yeah, remember the promissory note is the promissory note is only at the very tail end of the transaction. Up to that point in time, I have held the title, and they are just a tenant. So if they don't pay, and I'll talk a little bit later about ways that we minimize that default, but if they don't pay, I have the same rights as the owner of the apartment complex whose tenant doesn't pay. I go down to the magistrate court and file a bill. I guess that you were uh, holding the title, I was saying, you know. Okay, go ahead. Okay, all right. Yes, sir. So in the uh, communities we were doing this, or land these communities, and other people are paying a lot rent. You put the home in, you're renting the home. Are you charging a flat rental rate for the entire 12-year period, plus lot rent, or just a flat rental rate, or are you adjusting the rental rate throughout the period? Remember that everything I said here is that the house is separate from the lot. Okay. Our, our lot rent is actually due on the first of the month, and these lease option payments are due on the tenth of the month. So, so adjust your lot rent, but the home rent will that stay the same? Right. Right. For right. twelve years. Right. Right. We're, we're committing to that monthly payment on the house for that period of time. What the contract says is that we also freeze the lot rent for twelve months. And at the end of 12 months, it will increase to whatever the prevailing rate is at the property. So the lot rent will increase the house payment or the lease option payment will not. Okay, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the structure. Um, I've got some slides here. I don't know if you can read these from the back. I actually have some handouts of these. Uh, these are houses that we had at our SECO meeting. Uh, and in each case, what I've shown is the base price of the house the house of on-site, uh, the uh, cost of on-site things like setup and sturdy index and so forth. Um, the total cost of the house, um, the uh, acquisition financing. Remember that in our case, it's two transactions. One is a transaction involving the purchase of the house. And we may use our own money for that. We may go to a local bank to do it. We may go to a private investor to do it. Um, there are a number of different alternatives open to us to acquire the house. But one side of the transaction is the acquisition of the house itself, and then the other side of the transaction is the lease option that we do with the resident or the buyer, quote unquote, of the uh, house. So what I show here is the acquisition financing, in this case, 7% uh, per year and uh, 11 years that we amortized it. The monthly payment to the acquisition lender was 272 a month. When we turn around and sell the house, uh, in this particular example, the spreadsheet, I did no profit. We were selling the house for $33,000, um, $3,000 up front. And as far as financing is concerned, we, were, we appeared to be financing $30,000. We calculate our lease option payment at 3% over our cost of funds. So in this example, where I'm borrowing at seven, I'm gonna calculate the lease option payment at 10. And that 3% spread is intended to cover my default-related expenses. In this case, the uh, lease period was 11 years, and I had a uh, price to buy the house of $6,900, minus the $3,000 up front, left $3,900 owed, and that amounts to a zero interest over the next year. What is that, $325 uh, a month? Uh, that would be if I chose to finance their purchase of the house. 
And I've got a number of examples like this. Uh, this is a 1676. Uh, all of the same information. Um, this kind of indicates the uh, transaction itself, the fact that we have three, two different transactions, one involving the acquisition and the other one involving the sale of the house via lease option. We as a community owner are in the middle of that transaction. And what we do on the one doesn't affect the other. We commit to borrow the money from an acquisition lender and we're going to pay them regardless of what happens on this side of the transaction over here. Yes, sir. Spencer, what do you do about taxes and insurance? Taxes and insurance. Our contract requires the um, lease option resident, if you will, to uh, insure the house and to pay the tax. All st what you find is that some states actually don't allow a landlord to uh, pass that on to a, a tenant. So that's one of the nuances of lease law that we have to be uh, careful about. But they are required to both insure the house and pay the tax. We, of course, get notified if they don't. If they don't insure it, then we put it on our blanket policy and charge them back for it and amounts to a default of the uh, contract. Yes, sir. Spencer, that was a, one of those examples, the American bank or whatever. You're borrowing the money at 7%. Was that for seven or eight years, I think? It looked like it was a shorter term than you were than your lease was. Right. What we're trying to do is to make sure that we collect a little bit more money, uh, including a default-related expense, from the lease option buyer than what we're actually paying to the acquisition lender. So usually we finance about 75% of the total cost of the house. And usually, on say a $30,000 house, we'll spend about seven or eight, maybe $10,000 more to set up and skirting your debts and so forth. So 75% of the total usually works out to about the manufacturer's invoice. And so you're making 10% on your own money? If we use our own money, is that what you're saying? Well, the 25% that you're paying out of That's correct. Right. That's correct. Right. You're earning 10% on that. You're that's correct. out of 10%, right? Right. Okay, so how do you determine, so that's how you determine the payment. How do you determine the term? Um, generally, um, I don't want the term to be any longer than necessary. I think some of the financing that lenders have done in the past, where they're doing 20 and 30 year financing, we have had uh, people who were buying homes in our community come in and throw the keys on the desk and say, call a lender and tell them to come pick up the house. Uh, because after 10 years, they still owe 90% of what they, you know, were going to pay for the house in the first place. So what I do is try to get that term as absolutely short as possible, but obviously it needs to be affordable. So I pick somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 or 13% on a single wide, and maybe a year longer on a double wide. 12 or 13%? I'm sorry, years. years. Okay. And then um, and the option price is the remaining balance. Right? It's the that's principal balance at the end of that term. That's correct. Right. <clears throat> that's correct. If I, if I, um, and, then, and, and the, I mean, the, what, what strikes me, what's so ironic about this is that it's a credit transaction. Well, I would argue with well, you about that. But okay. well, I mean, the way, I mean, what I'm saying, I mean, you understand what I'm saying. Okay. All of the analysis that, that we do as the landlord is a credit transaction. But, to the government, it's not a credit transaction because it doesn't have those three criteria, all three of those criteria. Right. And, and you know, I'm not sure um, the owner of an apartment complex or a single family house uh, who rents a house wouldn't go through exactly the same arithmetic. They would, they would uh, possibly base rent more on what other comparable units are rented for, but they're also going to be looking at their internal rate of return, their return on investment. So my other question is, if the option price is supposed to be fair market value, where does that come into your analysis? I, I would argue, or I have argued, that that is one of the few situations where the decreasing value, what, what, what amounts to depreciating value of manufactured homes, works in our favor. We can go to things like NADA or, or, or some of these other appraisal services, and we can take a $30,000 house today and, and, and show that that house was probably, according to the data, 
which may or may not be correct, or we have the data to refer to, maybe only worth five or six or seven thousand uh, dollars, ten or twelve years from now. And so it's the it's the anticipated fair market value at the end of the term, right? It's not the agreed upon between my company who's originating this contract and the resident. Because I'm guessing that a lot of those people who are exercising their options for say four or five thousand dollars, that home is really worth twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars, or maybe more. You know, when you get into the value of a manufactured home, you get into this issue of is it a value moved or a value in place? Does it include skirting and the debts and everything else? Um, as we know, there's an awful lot of gray when we talk about the value of manufactured homes. So. Uh, I've never been challenged on this. I feel like I could support it if I had to. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Quick question. Yes, sir. What is your website? Do you say you have all this display? Uh, LeaseOptionMHSales.com. I think I have a slide with that later. LeaseOptionMHSales.com. Um, this is an article that I wrote that George published, and we actually reprinted it um, what, several years ago that describes this whole concept of lease option, everything that I've said so far about the legal arguments and the structure of the transaction uh, is, in, is in this article. And I believe that I saw this in the guidebook that George printed and gave to everyone uh, today. I also have some reprints of it. So let's talk about uh, defaults, because as I said a while ago, uh, you can't talk about uh, seller financing unless you talk about the likelihood of the cost of uh, defaults. When we first started selling these houses on these lease option contracts, this is what our default curve looked like. And the way you read this is the likelihood of default every year going forward in the contract. So when we initiate a contract at ground zero, at time zero, we had a 37% likelihood that, the, that that contract was going to default within the first year. And it drops significantly uh, down to about 15% the second year, 5% the third, and, and, and then it tapered off, and, and at that point the likelihood was very, very minimal. That was about five years into this program that we started in 1992. Uh, five years later, we were able to reduce those default rates. Uh, you see the yellow lines, uh, especially the first year, we were able to get the default rates uh, down significantly. I'm going to show you some information here shortly about how we got the default rates uh, even uh, lower uh, over the past uh, five or six years. This is another way of looking at defaults. Uh, it is the number of defaults that occur each year divided by the number of outstanding contracts. So you can see that in the past, uh, as many as 50%, or almost 50% of the contracts that we had in place defaulted that year. And I'm happy to say that in the last couple of years, those rates have come way, way down. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the reasons for that, too. Um, as I mentioned a while ago, we started selling new houses six years or so ago. We did that because the repo houses were getting expensive and fewer. Uh, obviously, we bought them from the finance companies, and finance companies went out of business. So um, we began looking at new houses about six years or so ago, and these are the default rates that we have experienced over the past six years on those houses. I'm sorry, I misspoke. These are all houses that we sold within that period of time. So it was both used and new houses. So to back up and make sure I'm clear, we started selling new houses six years ago, but during that time, we were also selling used houses. So what you see here are the defaults associated with all of those houses, both used and new, over that six-year period. And then what I did is I, uh, for this uh, meeting, uh, did some comparisons. So I started looking at what our default rates were on our used houses, our repo houses, versus our new houses. 
Uh, and, and obviously there are pros and cons in both cases. A new house is, um, smells good, looks good, uh, more expensive. Used house is a lot cheaper, uh, but it's, it's obviously been lived in. It's been rehab. Um, so um, you may have some thoughts as to which of those is going to have a lower uh, default rate. Yes, sir. Uh, just, I'm just curious, do you, how many homes do you have for sale at one time on average? And do you mix, do you, like, we've always found out that if we have a new home for sale and a, and a used re, refurbished home, that refurbished home is going to go quicker than that new home. That's just our market, typically. But then if we don't put it be used from a, and we leave our new homes out, they'll move. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you mix them or do you? We, we do mix them uh, because remember that we're uh, financing these houses uh, and when we do get a default, obviously we're going to resell it. So uh, when we resell it, it is a used house for us at that point in time. But to answer your question, we usually have two or three new houses at each community for sale at any one time. And, and my hope is that we have no used houses uh, at all. Uh, but sometimes we do, and, and we don't mind uh, selling both. Uh, the new house is going to be more expensive, you know, and it may be $500, the used house may be $350, the term may be longer on the new house. So they have pros and cons, but uh, some people choose used and some choose uh, new. So three or four about? I'm sorry? Three or four on average at, at, at each place? At each property, yeah, I would say that's right. Uh -huh. And just for clarification, a default is somebody who signed, who does not do the entire process. That's correct. They rent for the entire term and then exercise their option to purchase. Even if they say, hey, you know, I've signed a seven year lease and I, you know, to buy, and then after three years, they, they get a job in Florida. Right. So they say, hey, I'm, I'm going to give you the keys back. I'm forfeiting, they forfeit their deposit, I assume. That, in your mind, is a default. The That's correct. Is, the house is clean. It, 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 Right. Scrub the cabinets out, everything else is still a default. Right. Okay. Right. 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 Now we, we do have some provisions where we will buy the house under certain circumstances and we also allow people to transfer their contract to someone else. Um, but yes, a default is somebody who basically doesn't fulfill their contract with us. Um, so obviously we have the possibility of uh, new being better than used or vice versa. Um, here is the curve of default rates of um, repo houses. So the blue is all homes that we sold during that period, and the red is the default rate associated with the repo houses, the used houses. And here is the default rate associated with the new homes over that uh, same uh, period of time. And if we take the uh, blue out, you see a very significant difference between the default rates that we experience with used houses versus new houses. What do you attribute that to? Um, a number of things. Um, as I said a while ago, the appeal of a new house, the fact that it's never been lived in. Um, I'll talk uh, later about myths, but um, some people, as I say, get concerned about the sales price of a house. Uh, I would argue, I, I would tell you that the people that we deal with don't care what the sales price of the house is. All they focus on is what do I pay up front, what do I pay a month, and how many years do I have to pay it? So the fact that they have been somewhere else, probably been turned down for conventional financing somewhere else, they come to us at credit school maybe 550 or so, uh, but they see through us an opportunity to make that transition from uh, renter to homeowner. And, and uh, we, we, we try to keep the terms of the contract affordable. Um, I'll, I'll show you in a minute here some of the calculations that we go through, but we want to make absolutely sure that these people can and will make these payments. Yeah, but you do that on the used homes also. Yes. So the difference is it's theirs, it's, it was brand new to them, and this is really counterintuitive to me because I would think that the repo home would be less of a burden on the monthly income and therefore you have a lower default rate. But obviously your data does not show that. So. Right, right. Our down payments are generally lower on a, on a, uh, a used house. The and monthly payments home. are lower, the term is shorter, um, but the default rates are lower on a new house. Is less. 
I beg your pardon? And their income is probably less. Oh. Well, we qualify them all based on debt to income ratios, but yeah. Pretty much everybody buys the most house they can afford. Right. Uh, right. right. Well, the upfront right. investment on the new home is obviously higher, which might right. have an attributing factor as to the fewer number of defaults. Right. New will be four to six thousand dollars up front. Used would be two to three thousand, two to four thousand maybe. So here is that data in summary format. Um, our total default rate over a five year period or so on a repo, 38% will default within a five or six year period. So if we sold 100 used houses today, 38% of those would default in the next five years. If they are new houses, the default rate is 5.3%. I was talking with uh, Tim Williams this morning. He said uh, if you had a larger sample, he would find that those numbers still hold true, although they're not as extreme as what you experience. But he said uh, the default rates on used houses is, is uh, in, in, in 21st mortgage situation also significantly higher than new houses. Yes, uh huh. Spencer, under your contract, who's responsible for maintenance of the house? Maintenance of the house is the uh, resident's responsibility. So that may partly account for this because the new homes, they're, they're better able to know that whatever I'm paying each month, that's what it's going to be. Exactly. There's fewer things are going wrong. If you use home, they think this is what it's going to be, but there's going to be maintenance stuff that happens. That, that's exactly right. Um, and, and that really was my question this morning about the warranty. It is such a security blanket for these people to move in and to know that they're not going to have to worry about anything for the next year. And if we could extend that to three or four or five years, in fact, I want to talk to, uh, I think it was Jim uh, Reiser, uh, was talking about the fact that he includes in all of his houses a seven-year warranty. I don't know what the cost of that is. Somebody was saying somewhere in the neighborhood of $400, and they actually only charge $200 and basically sell it at a $200 loss, um, I, I, I would do that because I think it would, uh, it would help our sales. Yes, ma'am. If it's a lease, okay, with an option, why are you requiring the tenant to maintain the house that they're leasing? Because I don't want to maintain it myself because I know that they're going to take care of it okay. if they are responsible for maintaining it themselves. I, as I said a while ago, some state law doesn't allow a landlord to do that. But if I can do it, I will. I want to. Um, but what kind of? Uh, tell us about these new houses you're buying. What, what manufacturer are them? What are they? What, what are they? Three twos? What are they? Uh, usually for us, uh, what works is a three bedroom, two bath, uh, 1676. Uh, we do uh, do some uh, single whites, uh, double whites. Um, uh, we have done a couple of two bedrooms, but. Our communities are not in a retirement market, so we generally cannot sell to uh, seniors who are looking for a smaller house. Uh, and, and we found that if we sell a two-bedroom house to a young couple, it's only a matter of time before they're going to outgrow the house. Um, so typical for us is three bedrooms do that. And as far as manufacturers, uh, we've over the last uh, you know six years or so, we've dealt with with most of them: Fleetwood, uh, Clayton. Um, um, who am I missing? Champion. 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 <laughs> are there any homes that you find that are preferable under this scenario? Any manufactured homes? I would answer that by saying that the community series house, those, those manufacturers who have embraced the community series concept, the, the sex appeal, the eye candy, uh, I like when someone walks into a house and, and they're impressed with the, the kitchen, the bedroom, the bath. Um, but but in, from one manufacturer to another, um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of difference in plants. I think it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes in our industry to generalize based on the manufacturer. I find that one plant will do one thing better or worse than another plant uh, will. So I tend to put more emphasis on the plant than I do the manufacturer. Um, where was I? Okay, that, uh, those figures uh, there. Okay, and this is, uh, to answer somebody's question a while ago, our experience with new houses. 
Obviously, I am, based on this data, a strong, strong supporter of new houses. And, and I've got 25 years under my belt with a lot of repo houses, a lot of used houses, and 60-something uh, new houses. But my experience indicates that new houses are easier and quicker for us to sell. They attract a more upscale resident. The buyer is more satisfied. We have fewer defaults. Those defaults that we do have are less expensive. When someone defaults on a new house, um, two out of three new houses that we've had on defa defaults were in sales ready condition when they moved out. We, we did absolutely nothing to the house. And in the case of new houses, they upgrade our communities and make them look better. So I, I like new houses. Uh, uh, Byron didn't pay me to uh, say that, uh, but I'm sure he uh, appreciates the fact that I did. Yes, sir. Going back <clears throat> to the sales or use tax of the house, when is it paid? Well, in our case, we pay it up front, but, but sales tax, remember, is a, a state function. Right. And, and different states do it different ways. In Texas, the sales tax is added to the cost of the house when the manufacturer sells it. But if you're in a state where the sales tax is, is on the purchase agreement and charged to the consumer, you could not do it in this case. I'm sorry, say that again? If, you, if you're in a state where sales tax would be a line item on a purchase agreement, could you do that in this case? You know, I've never been questioned by the uh, uh, sales tax office. Uh, my uh, impression is that they're happy to get the money. I think this is a gray area of the law in terms of whether you pay it up front, or you can spread it out over time. But, you're, um, but the we, states where the, where the tax is, is included in your retail price without being broken out, you just simply include it in your price. That's correct. Okay. And, and, I, and I like that procedure. I wish more states would adopt that procedure. But uh, Texas does. You don't, you don't have to pay it. The option is taxable. I'm sorry, say again? The option price is taxable also because you're transferring the title. We, show, we pay sales tax based on the, the initial sales price of the house, yeah. but we don't pay it again based yeah. on the option price. When you transfer title, they don't pay sales tax? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -uh. I would argue that we've already paid it on, say, the $40,000 sales price. Why should they pay it on this component, you which is included it. in that? You own it then when you bought it. Now you're selling it to your buyer. You don't pay sales tax so then, right, when you sell it. Yeah, well, we, we well, paid it up front. Probably depends on your Surely I don't have to pay it twice. In Texas, when you, you have to pay it twice. You have to pay it in Texas. Florida. Yeah. 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 So only one time. You never, if that, that house gets sold right. six or seven or eight times, very state, no sales tax. Right. Well, remember now, in Texas, it's included in the cost of the house from the manufacturer, so there's never any question one about it. Yeah. In Georgia, uh, we pay it one time and never worry about it again. But you're selling it for free. There's no price. No, it's $4,000. Right. Right. It's the option price. Right. It doesn't matter. You're transferring the title. You can't. How do you get the title into the name of the buyer if you don't take it down to the DMV and Is you don't do that? It's not an issue. Uh, maybe it would be in another state. Okay, so it's a title. Well, in most right. states exempt sales yes. tax on yes. free owned homes. I'm sorry, Possibly say that again. from a state that they want. Oh, unused homes. I said most states exempt pre-owned homes for sales tax. Okay. Possibly this gentleman is from a state that does not. We do. Yeah. That's Florida. Florida, we have. Florida is a tax state. Every okay. time yes. In that case, possibly the resident would have to pay it. No. Yeah. Right, right, right. When they title it. Yeah. But it's a good question because sales tax is obviously one of those unique state issues. Right. Um, okay, so uh, another thing that we looked at is our default rates on single wide versus double wide. And again, you've got the pros and cons, double wide being more expensive, uh, obviously, than a new uh, single wide. Um, so again, it could go either way. But this curve shows the default rates on the um, single wides, which is the red line. And the green line is our default rate on uh, new double wides. And, and, and in case you can't read that slide, that default rate on new double wides is zero. We have not yet had, knock on wood, the first default on a new uh, double wide. 
Uh, Tim Williams was telling me that as time goes on, we will probably experience more defaults on our double wides. But uh, when I put this data together about a month or so ago, the first thing I did was order two more double wides. <laughs> Okay, uh, there is that data summarized. 5.9% uh, default rate on the single wides versus zero on the double wides. So let me tell you now about uh, something that we put into effect about six years ago. We refer to this as a pre-qualification worksheet. And again, I think George has included this in the guidebook that he has uh, given to everybody. But we did this as a means of standardizing procedures. And we did it about six years or so ago. We began selling new houses. I didn't want anybody who was processing an application to rush to judgment. I didn't want someone to say that this person is automatically disqualified because they don't have enough income, or they don't have enough of a down payment, or their credit is too bad. I wanted us to look at the whole picture. So we did it to avoid based, wasting um, time building relationships. Some of these um, um, consultants, uh, marketing consultants, uh, have suggested in the past that because we are a retailer and because our manager is in the office waiting on people to come in and buy a house, that uh, we should spend time establishing a pool with them and building a relationship and showing them houses. Well, I found that if I allowed the managers to spend that much time with everybody who came in, they wouldn't get anything else done. So I wanted a procedure that would allow us to very quickly zero in on those people who were qualified and eliminate as best we could those uh, who were not. So um, what we did with this um, pre-qualification worksheet is uh, we were uh, attempting to eliminate people that we we, we felt like we didn't want to sell a house to. Uh, one is a renter. If someone comes and they say, I'm simply interested in renting a house. I don't want to buy, I just want to rent. Then we tell them that there's probably another place uh, that will serve their needs uh, better. Because our community and our program is designed to help you make the transition from a renter to a, a homeowner. Um, if they have insufficient income, you know, somebody comes in and uh, unfortunately they're on uh, Social Security and make $1,000 a month, they can't afford a $40,000 or $50,000 uh, house. And we need to know that as quickly as possible. If they don't have enough of a down payment that we feel is going to motivate them to make those payments, we want to rule them out. If someone got a raise but went out and did something dumb, like committed to a $500 a month truck payment, we want to eliminate that person. If they can't, then afford our payments. If they have a uh, 825 credit score, um, you might say, boy, that's a great prospect. Uh, true story, we had a couple come in uh, a year or so ago, and the lady said, our credit score is 825. Mine's 425 and his is 400. Uh, obviously, they uh, were not uh, qualified. Uh, and obviously you have the undesirables, the uh, drug dealers and the prostitutes and the people with uh, rental history problems and domestic problems. So uh, what we're looking at with the pre-qualification worksheet is we're looking at the landlord reference, uh, we're looking at their income, uh, how long they've been renting, what their rental history is, criminal history, credit report, down payment available, debts and obligations, and income and employment history. I think that totals eight different areas that we focus on. And what we have done with this is actually put it into a spreadsheet. So when someone comes in and says, I'm interested in buying a house, our manager pulls up that spreadsheet and enters that information on the spreadsheet. And, and if the bottom line indicates that they pass, then they pass that information on to one of the ladies in the office along with their application, and she processes the application. Um, so, in addition to the down payment, we're also getting debts and obligations and we're getting their income and uh, employment history because we want to calculate their debt to income ratios. And as somebody said uh, this morning, generally speaking, we're looking at front-end debt to income ratio not exceeding 30%. 
and the front end ratio is housing costs divided by gross income. Housing costs for us is lot rent and house payment. And a back end ratio not to exceed 40%. A back end ratio is housing costs plus other debts. So that guy who's got the $500 truck payment is going to have $500 in expenses in addition to his housing costs. And we divide that by gross income, we get their back end ratio. So again, the reason for doing this in a spreadsheet is the spreadsheet will automatically do that calculation once they enter it into the spreadsheet. We don't have to have a form for people to fill out. Fill out. We don't have to teach them basic math and, and they're working through the formulas. So here's an example, uh, $2,700 a month in gross income, $300 in uh, child support, $3,000 a month total, $300 a month in lot rent, $500 in the lease option payment, so their housing costs are $800. Their front end debt ratio in that example is 27%. That is acceptable to us. Uh, in terms of the back end ratio, uh, they're also paying $350 a month in child support, so their back end ratio is 38%, the 1150 divided by the 3000. Um, the guy who also has a $400 a month truck payment is going to have a back end ratio of 52%, which is not acceptable to us. We recently, uh, true story, had a situation where a guy came in and, and had this a uh, very expensive truck payment, and we turned him down, and we said, basically, you, you, you can't afford this house. We, we don't feel comfortable with you being able to make the payments. And he said, what can I do? And I, and I said, if you will replace that truck with something less expensive, we will take another look at your application. And he did, and he came back a couple weeks later, uh, and he replaced it with a car. Um, it was a five or six year old car. But his payment went down to about 350 or 300, which we felt he was uh, he could afford, and we approved him. Uh, one of the nice things I like about these debt to income ratios that we calculate is that they coincide with the information that we get from CFPB in terms of ability to repay. We run into that term a lot when we look at CFPB and federal regulations. Um, I also looked at our um, default rates, comparing uh, homes before we started using this pre-qualification worksheet to sales that we did afterwards. And this slide shows those default rates. The red is uh, homes before we began using the pre-qualification worksheet, and the green is after. Now these are all used houses. These are not new houses, and the reason I did that is that we started using the pre-qualification worksheet at the same time we, we began selling new houses. So to compare apples to apples, I used used houses since we started the pre-qualification versus used houses before. But you can see that when we summarize that data, <coughs> our total defaults before we began using the pre-qualification worksheet is almost 43 percent and after the pre-qualification worksheet it's uh, just about half that much. Didn't you have a recession in the first half? I'm sorry? Wasn't there a major recession in 09 and 10? There was. There was. There was. This is an article I think George also uh, included in that guidebook. Um, it uh, talks about this whole uh, pre-qualification worksheet that we use. And lastly, I want to just comment on some of the myths that I have heard about lease option uh, over the years. Um, one is people say they are the same as rentals. And I'll, my experience is they are not. Uh, an awful lot depends on the intent of the uh, parties. Um, when I rented uh, homes and when I talked to community owners who rent, uh, my default rates were much, much higher than anything that I experienced uh, selling houses. So my experience renting over homes is not good. My experience selling homes on lease option, as I've indicated a while ago, is exceptionally good. 
Another is that a buyer will object to the lease option contract because of the complexity of the contract. And I've had community owners say, boy, how do I explain to them that they're buying an option? How do I explain to them that they have the option to buy this house with this amount in the future? And what I tell community owners is if you do that, you are shooting yourself in the foot. You are overselling the transaction. They don't care what the format of the transaction uh, is. All they care about is what they pay up front, what they pay a month, and how many months they have to pay. It. So don't muddy the water, in my opinion, talking about the glory details of the transaction. Again, their primary focus needs to be to make the transition from a renter to a homeowner. If that's what they want to do, then I have the program for them. If they want to rent, they need to go somewhere else. Yes, sir. So thinking about your own portfolio, say in the next 30, 40 years, if you're anticipating a long-term hold, as the stock ages out, after somebody has successfully completed their long-term option purchase, if they pass away or they move, you as the portfolio owner, what's your decision point? Do you rehab that home and do a new lease option on a 20-year-old home that's worth five grand, but you can put a 10 into it or uh, make it habitable, or are you now going to get rid of it and put it in your home and start over? Well, I don't treat that any differently than in any other house that somebody abandons. Mm -hmm. uh, if they you know, bought it for cash, for instance, and then they abandon the house, um, I may go through the process of taking possession of it. In Georgia, that's not easy. In Texas, it's not very easy either. Um, but yeah, sometimes we make an effort to buy an abandoned house. Um, we've had many houses that were, what, 30, 40 years old that were beyond their useful life. And we hired somebody to dismantle the house and haul it off piece by piece, or in some cases, uh, hauled it to the, to the uh, local dump. But I wouldn't treat a house that was under lease option where they fulfilled the contract any differently than I would any other house. Um, another is that my market can't afford this house. I uh, hear community, say, uh, community owners say, all I've done is rent houses, uh, manufactured homes in the past, and I was able to get about $300 a month for a 15-year-old uh, used house. And the idea of my people coming up with $5,000 and $500 a month for 12 years is just unfathomable. I can't imagine my people doing it. And my response to that is, you're right. Those people who rented a used house with a $500 security deposit and $300 a month and defaulted after six months are not the people who are going to buy these houses. So my experience is, if you offer them this new house with this financing alternative, they will take advantage of it. So, um, my feeling is the sales price is irrelevant. What they care about are those three things I mentioned a while ago. Build and they will come. If you offer it and you're patient and you qualify the prospects, uh, the right people will come along and you'll be very happy five to ten years down the pipe. Um, I listed a whole bunch of questions that we could talk about. Uh, we've obviously addressed some of these questions along the way. Um, but for all intent and purposes, this is all I have. Um, before I close, I just want to plug our Southeast Community Owners Conference in Atlanta uh, next month. This is a program that's put together by small community owners, for small community owners. We'll have four uh, houses on display, four community series houses on display. Uh, we operate as a nonprofit, so the registration fee is incredibly low. It's $199 for the two or three days. Legacy Homes, which happens to have a plant on the outskirts of Atlanta, is doing a free plant tour, leaving from the hotel on Tuesday, the day before. Um, uh, everything about this is, uh, is reasonable. The hotel rooms are only $89 a night. Uh, at a Holiday Inn, um, so it's a it's a program where like, we'll have uh, close to 200 people probably this year uh, coming. So love love to have any of you uh, join us. 
And I'd be glad to take any uh, questions that anyone has at this point. You had your hand up. Yes, sir. Jason, where are you? Okay. Um, I would say that, that and I'm not going to promote the CEO of Marketing in a way, but the content's excellent. It's um, probably some of the best content out there if you guys are smaller operators. Um, every year that I go there, I'm going to do that. Thank you. I, I, uh, I think that a lot of uh, small community owners are, uh, you know, rightfully concerned about compliance issues, and uh, this is not a um, a solution without any uh, issues. Um, there are other things that we have to pay attention to, like uh, identity theft, uh, like fair credit, like fair housing, uh, money laundering. I mean, those are government regulations that uh, we can't disregard. Uh, just because we are uh, selling a house on lease option. Um, but I would uh, say to you that my understanding is that most of the large operators uh, have had lease option programs available for years. Most of them have the resources to hire the legal staff to put these programs in place. And a lot of small community owners cannot, have not, or have been scared by um, compliance issues that people have brought up. And um, I, I can tell you that um, in my case, this has been a, uh, a very good program for us to be involved in. Other questions? Anybody? Okay, well thank you all very much. See you later on.